Hello and welcome to the Real Women Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman magazine and global community Facebook page. I'm Jenny Robertson, one of the hosts of the Real Women Real Purpose talk show, and I'm also the founder and publisher of On Purpose Woman magazine and the founder of the On Purpose Woman global community. My guest today is author, retreat leader, and transformation guide, Laurie Morin, and we'll be talking about the myth of the good girl and other lies patriarchy taught you. Welcome, Laurie. As a recovered good girl, <laughs> this is a topic I love to talk about, so I'm really excited you're here. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. And so before we dive into our, our exciting topic, I want to tell our viewers a little bit more about you. <clears throat> Author Laurie Morin is best known for her book, She Rose Journey, and its story-guided self-discovery framework to help you find the space, time, and resources to prioritize yourself, rewrite your old stories, and create a clear vision for the future. Through her book, Retreats, Coaching, and Community, Laurie supports those ready to plan adventurous lives and legacies. So, Laurie, your book, Shiro's Journey, A Story-Guided Adventure to Self-Discovery and Empowerment, is about making yourself the Shiro or the lead character in your, in your own story and releasing all those old stories that don't align with who we are. The good girl is an old story, right? And it's an old story. Absolutely. There. So say a little bit about um, what you think a good girl is and, and how you came to know her. <laughs> well, I came to know her quite personally because I was brought up to be a good girl. And um, I think, you know, I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s. And it was a time when um, girls were told that they should follow the rules and not make waves. And um, the underlying belief there was well, if you do that, you're going to be loved. So in my family, I was the one who was always good. I always followed the rules. I had a brother two years younger than I was who um, acted out a little bit more. And I did get my parents' love and approval for being the one that was easy to deal with. So I learned at an early age, well, this is the way to kind of get the love and approval. And when I went to school, the same thing continued. Um, like most elementary schools, I think I had mostly women for teachers and they were lovely people, but they really wanted us to just stay in line, color within the lines, follow the rules, do your homework. And when you did that, you got rewarded. So it was kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can do that. That's pretty easy. And I'm going to get A's and then I'm going to get a hot fudge Sunday. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't I be a good girl? So many of us were indoctrinated into that um, philosophy, if you will, about, you know, the word I heard a lot is just behave, just mm -hmm. be. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, I, I remember as a little girl, like up until prob probably five or six, I guess I was good enough, but I was also this massive show off. I mean, I, if there was more than one person in the room, I would entertain them. Mm -hmm. I would a little toy guitar and I would sing and I would dance and I would play. And around the age of six or seven, that stopped being cute to my mother. Mm -hmm. And so not only did me wanting to get their approval and their love affect my behaving, you know, in, in a good girl kind of way, what I also realized it did for me is it told me that these other things weren't even appropriate, like showing off or, yes. or being a little too big of, you know, too big or too mm -hmm and all of that so yes you were breaking <laughs> another rule you yeah. were breaking the unspoken rule you know that girls should be quiet and invisible or at least not take up too much space and when you do that you get rewarded and if you're too big for your britches you know that's not seen as a very feminine thing to do or that's how it was back in the 1950s and 60s yes well, then how, how did this, it originated, I guess, with parents or our caregivers, whoever our, our primary caregivers were, it was fostered by our teachers. Mm -hmm. And we, when we start to break through of that, apparently you did, right? Do you remember how that, how old you were when you started to realize this wasn't the best way for you to live? Oh, I, I would hate to admit how old I was, probably in my thirties. Mm -hmm. I, um, 
was a good girl or when I wasn't a good girl, I hid it for a very long time because that's the way I got by in the world. I can so, well, um, and, and I would say, you know, it goes back before our parents. When you look at the stories that are handed down to us, especially from our mothers, they're stories they got from their mothers, they got from their grandmothers, and they've just been passed down through the ages in a way that nobody questioned. So nothing really changes until we start to question, you know, where the stories came from and whether they're still relevant. Um, they may have been necessary. And one of the things I say about being a good girl in some of these other myths is they protect us. So um, a story that's kind of a corollary to being a good girl is this being quiet and being on invisible which I did as a child because um, it was a way to avoid getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, in a somewhat chaotic family, the more I was under the radar screen, the better off I was. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and it, it worked, you know, we continue doing these things because they work for us, but it worked until it didn't work anymore. And it was when I was out in the professional world Actually, it was when I was a, a law professor that I realized, you know, going into a faculty meeting and being invisible is not helping me because people aren't seeing my leadership. They're not seeing my contribution and it's no longer protecting me. It's actually hurting me. Mm -hmm. So that was a big aha moment, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> a number of big aha moments. <laughs> I had to see it pretty often before I decided it was time to do something about it. Well, before we, I want to talk more about how you came to that decision and then what you did next. But, you know, when you said that you, um, you remained a good girl well into your thirties. And I remember, you know, you and I chatted a little bit before this, that, you know, when I went away to college, having freedom for the first time, I became more of that other girl. I wasn't always, mm -hmm. the girl, yet I hid it. I wouldn't yes. let anybody who mattered would ever know, yes. but it wasn't until my thirties as well, my early thirties, when I realized I needed to leave my marriage and I knew mm -hmm. how disappointed my parents were going to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, you know, you stayed married in our family. And that was probably the first break that I, I made was I had to make that decision and stand up for myself. And I don't think I realized I was doing any kind of rebelling or anything against good girl. I just, mm -hmm. you know, starting to wake up. That was a wake up call for me. So you started to get these clues that, you know, you're, you're this brilliant woman, you've got this education, you know what you're doing, yet you're kind of invisible when right. you walk into the room like you were when you were a child. Exactly. And you Nobody just, else knows what I have to offer. Okay. Yes. And so you decided that wasn't going to work for you. What did you do? <laughs> do you remember what you did next? Um, I do remember what I did. And it's actually something I started teaching my students to do, my, my female students to do. And that is, um, after, once I realized where it came from and why it wasn't working, I started slowly taking baby steps to change it. I mean, I don't think you can change those kinds of behaviors overnight. So um, I started saying, all right, at the next faculty meeting, I'm going to make one comment and I'm going to make it early and get it over with. So I don't have anxiety through the whole meeting. And I just kept building on that until, um, and, and I never got to the point where I was one of the people who dominated meetings, you know, because the, the flip side of some of these stereotypes that we buy into is the shadow side. And it could be the rebel, or in that case, it can be the show off or the, you know, the person who wants the floor and wants all the attention. And we all have to find our own balance. So um, it's a process. And I think one of the reasons I wrote the book was to kind of guide people through a process. I did a lot of self-help journaling rewriting things about my childhood, rewriting stories to get to the truth 
of what's really me and what was my conditioning. Mm. I think you said something really big there to get to the truth mm -hmm. of what was you and what was your conditioning. How did you start to tell the difference? You know, when you start journaling, I think um, I, I follow Julia Cameron's artist way, which is just free write, just let it all out. The truth comes out. And sometimes you say things that even surprise you, that you didn't even know consciously that you were thinking, but they were percolating there in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And what I like about that process is it brings things to the surface. Once you see them, you can deal with them. But if you don't even know they're there, it's really hard to do it. Do it. I agree. I agree. You mentioned that you didn't become the person once you started becoming aware, you still didn't become the person who went in and dominated because mm -hmm. it's probably not in your basic personality. No. The, right? Yes. My, my truth is that I'm a little bit reserved. Mm -hmm. I'm on the quiet side. I have to think deeply before I say anything. So I'm never gonna get up and just blurt out the first thing on my mind. But I did wanna to get to the point where I said the second and third and 10th thing on my mind. Mm -hmm. And that was the balance I had to find that I think everybody has to find. There's so much power in that. There's so much power in sitting in the room, knowing that you can say whatever you want and deciding if you want to or not. Yes, absolutely. Not being absolutely. guided by some fear that you had um, before deep down inside. Mm -hmm. That's a valuable lesson for anyone watching today. Right. Yeah, and, and I think the fear is, you know, if I say this, they're not going to like me mm -hmm. or they're not going to agree with me and we're going to get into a fight and I don't like controversy and, you know, mm -hmm. and all of those fears that govern our behavior um, really hold us back from expressing who we are. So, you know, I'm 70 now. I turned 70 in December and I finally feel yeah, like right. 70 is good. <laughs> I really finally feel like I, I can use my voice to, to say my truth. Mm -hmm. And people may like it, people may not like it, but um, it's too late for me to hold back and worry about what other people think, what the consequences are going to be, um, because, you know, otherwise, there's this old saying, you know, don't die with a song in your heart. And I didn't want to get to the end of my life and regret not saying what I really thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've said so many great things in that um, what came from up for me was, um, I, I want to kind of paraphrase what you said, because it's mm -hmm. an important point, is that anybody watching who still feels like she's in some of that good girl or people pleasing or any of those other um, stories that keep us down, that it's not about changing your personality. It's not about shifting into the opposite of that. It's about letting the authentic you come up and be seen and heard. Absolutely. That's it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I was always verbal. I was always quite verbal, even mm -hmm. though I was, I was always watching to see what do I do now? What's mm -hmm. the safest thing for me to do here? So I never had to you know, hold that back. But I do know that when I started finding this, this person inside, she was also kind of angry. Mm -hmm. so I did become some of that other person for a while. I kind of went to the other side in my male dominated industry. Yes. You know, yes. Which is, you know kind of become kind of rather bitchy, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, just holding my own. And I think, I think it was really okay that I did that because I was able to then realize what wasn't working. This doesn't work either. You know, right. who, right. I'm not that person either. Who am I? Mm -hmm. Right. The matter is, I think I say all that to say it's a process that takes a while sometimes. Mm -hmm. It is a process. And, you know, sometimes when you go to the opposite side, it not only teaches you more about who you are, but it lets other people see that you're multidimensional. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a nice so, way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we've mentioned the good girl, which we're talking about mm -hmm. making here and I brought up you know people pleaser and I think you did mm -hmm. too are there, are there other stories that get in the way specifically of women of you know living that adventurous life that you want us to live yes I mean I, I think 
Another one is always putting other people's needs before your own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if you think about it as a dichotomy of feminine and masculine, those are feminine traits and masculine traits are more assertive and aggressive. But if you think of it as a continuum, we all are nurturers and caregivers to some extent, but when we make that 100% of what we are, we're giving up something of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that need to always take care of everybody else. And for women, some of it comes from necessity. Um, we're usually the primary caretakers of children. When our parents get elderly, as my mom is right now, we usually end up being the primary caregivers for our parents. And you know, but we carry that over into the rest of our lives. So that, for example, um, I was in a law school setting and I would become the person everybody dumped their problems on because I'm a good listener and compassionate and empathetic. And students would all come to me when they were having difficulties. And I like, I like that role. So we do it because it feeds our sense of being needed and of belonging. And it feels good until it doesn't feel good. And then, you know, the, uh, the extreme is we become martyrs and we get resentful and we get angry because we're not taking care of our own needs as well as everybody else's. Yeah. And then we become resentful and instead of actually... Mm -hmm. What's going on with us? We can lash out at the people that we feel are making us do that, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. We blame them when really we should be looking at ourselves. Yeah, it's yeah. so interesting you brought up the caregiver because in my in my meeting this morning, my speaker talked about she was talking about four archetypes that can help us mm -hmm. be successful, and she used the two pairings of caregiver and warrior. Mm -hmm. and yes, yes. Blend of those, we have a mm -hmm. nice of caregiver warrior but the extreme on either side is what you're talking about exactly exactly yes I love that I, I'll have to listen to that replay um, I think archetypes have a lot to teach us and you know when you when you were saying where do the stories come from a lot of them come from mythology folk tales um, even the movies that we saw as kids if you think about things like Cinderella or Snow White there were never any female heroines of movies who, um, like we have today, Moana and some of those heroines who are actually self-actualized young women. They were all traditional girls who were subservient, who um, felt like their, their goal in life was to get a husband and to be taken care of. And in Cinderella's case, who, you know, was expected to do all the housework and take care of her stepsisters and her wicked stepmother, who is another archetype of the evil woman, um, until she got rescued. So that's what we grew up with. Mm -hmm. So it's no wonder that we internalized a lot of these, what are really archetypes and thought that that's what we were supposed to be when we grew up. Yeah. I had a glimmer of, of light and hope from Nancy Drew. She was my shooter. <laughs> yes. And, and you know, what I most remember, in fact, I was talking about her at a meeting one day, we were talking about, you know, who's who were some of the women that you emulate, whether they were real mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. And I remember reading Nancy Drew books and thinking, wow, her parents let her go out and do this stuff. I mean, she's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. and her friend is a supporting character in her. Right. No, yes, you, you picked her. one of the few. <laughs> yes. She drove her little blue roadster and he sat in the passenger side and he, yes. so he helped her. He aided her when she wanted him to. Absolutely. And I think that was a message that might've gotten lost on some of us, but it was a, it was an important one for me when I looked back that I mm -hmm. actually saw a, a, a young girl who was doing something really adventurous and yes. risky and she was so smart and all mm -hmm. of those things. So yeah, she was, she was that for me at that time. Uh, she was one of my favorite characters too. And, 
you know, as I got older, it was mostly autobiographies and biographies that inspired me. But there was Nancy Drew, there was Joe in Little Woman. Oh, yes. Who, yes. <laughs> um, so there were a few. There were a few. And I like the Hardy Boys too, but not nearly as much as Nancy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So are there any other archetypes, if you will, or stories that we grow up with that you that are important that you yes. think shape us? What are some of those? I think I think I want to talk about one that um, was true when we were growing up, and that shifted for young girls in the maybe nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties. But I want to talk about it because I think the net result is the same. So when I was growing up. Um, it, I got a very clear message that a woman's place was in the home, that what I was expected to do was to get married and have children. Maybe if I wanted to be a nurse or a teacher and have mother's hours, that would be okay. But that really my role was to be in the home. And I think because some of us lived through that, we raised our daughters differently and we raise them with a different archetype, which is the super mom. You can have it all and you can do anything you want, but you're still going to have primary responsibility for the home and the children and the appointments and everything else that goes with it. And the net result is that young women today, and I saw this a lot in my students, they were so stressed out and so overwhelmed. They were trying to do their best at work. They were trying to succeed professionally. They put off the decision to have kids until the last minute. And But then, you know, many women want to have children. So they had to go through that process of deciding when and how and how that was going to work. And then they got penalized for it um, by being put on the mommy track and being held back from promotions. So um, we haven't figured out a way as a society to share what some people would call the burdens or what you might call the privileges of having a home and a family mm -hmm. and also having a career at the same time. And I don't have any great big answer to it, um, but what I, what I tell a young woman I work with is, I think it's a question of looking at your life as chapters. And at some points when you're establishing your career, you may have to put that first. I don't believe in life work balance. I don't think there is such a thing. I so agree with you on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But but I do think there's work life alignment. Mm -hmm. So you can make a conscious decision. All right, for the next five years, I'm giving my all to this profession. But then I'm going to shift my priorities and I'm going to give my all to nurturing children and, you know, creating a family. And, you know, it's, I'm not saying that makes it easy, but I do think it um, takes away some of the stress of feeling like you have to juggle it all, all the time and all at the same time. Yes, I, I agree with that. And I, I think the pandemic also showed us how little that had changed, that yeah. you know, women being responsible because women, women were affected way more than men Yes, in their careers when the children were at home and having to be schooled at home and all of that. Right. You know, seen reports on the income disparities that came out. I mean, they were already there big right. time. Mm -hmm. what came out of, out of just those two years of women having to kind of take that back seat again. Right. You know, I remember reading a, a story about a woman who was, you know, she was working from home trying to hold down her, her little child at the same time. And she was on a meeting, a Zoom meeting with right. people. And her two-year-old came running into the office mm -hmm. and her boss contacted her later and says, I never want to see that again. Oh, and she had made the decision to leave, leave her job because she goes, he's two. I can't lock the door. Right. Right. Anyway. So, yeah. you know, that's you know, it was like that when we were growing up. And it's like that. It's still like that to so many um, in so many instances today. But I do like what you said about how you counseled young women that, you know, it's OK to want to be a mom. It's OK to mm -hmm. want to be married. 
Mm -hmm. What happened too is we were coming up and I, I was a little too young for the feminist movement at its beginnings. Yes. And I started to pay attention around 20 something, early 20s. Mm -hmm. But there started to be this divide between women who were taking, who were, you know, taking jobs, forming careers, putting their children in daycare, mm -hmm. and women who were choosing to stay home. Right. Um, the women who were in careers were mocking the stay-at-home moms, and the stay-at-home moms were mock, were disparaging the right. uh, women for putting their children in daycare. So we were really at odds back then. Yes. In an interesting way. And so I think there, you know, the shame has to be taken out of both of those. Yes. And no, I, like I think I think in those early days, women thought that's what they had to do to succeed professionally. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I think it it has changed a little bit. Um, I was heartened when I would see um, a lot of newscasters who had to do their programs from home and both men and women in would come the dog or one or two, one or two children come running through the screen. Mm -hmm. And most people thought that was adorable. Most people did not have the reaction that your friend's boss had, um, which, you know, they, they say that the great resignation is mostly woman. I don't think it's a great resignation. They're not resigning because they don't want to work anymore. They're resigning because employers have made it impossible for them mm -hmm. to do the things that they need to do. Yeah. And, you know, maybe the labor shortage will trigger a whole new kind of perspective on what work should be. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the, the statistics that have come out that said, um, wow, they're getting more work done at home than they did in the office. Right, right. There's lots of good reasons why. Right. And, you know, if you can be home and your child can be there with you and you don't mm -hmm. have that concern. Right. You know, run out of a meeting because all of a sudden they're sick. Right. So it's just so much easier. And, and I think, you know, more and more men, as you said, have stepped into those roles as well. So it benefits all of us. Yes. And change comes hard sometimes, but I think it does. That, yeah. At least get people I'm, looking at, at options more than they did before. Right. I, I think the point you just made is an important one. You know, we think about patriarchy as oppressing women, but patriarchy oppressed everybody. Mm -hmm. It oppressed men too, because they were expected to be the breadwinners. They were expected to work 80 hours and never see their families and their children. Mm -hmm. And it, that wasn't good for them. Yeah. So it's not that men or, you know, male values are wrong. It's that we don't have a balance as a society. And that's, you know, feminism is, is often, um, I think, misinterpreted as being anti-male. Mm -hmm. It's not right. about women taking over. It's about women having a seat at the table. Right. With men and and co-creating together and right. um, co-managing and doing all the things that that we need to do to run a society mm -hmm. so it's not um you know we're not going to be um, up with our swords wanting to put all the men um, down in the nursery taking care of all the kids you know right. <laughs> yeah, it could be fun for a day <laughs> <laughs> but we'd be down there making sure they were doing it to our you know to our <laughs> probably well, let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, why did you decide to write it? And just tell us a little bit, you know, if there's something that we haven't touched on that you think is important that your book is about. Okay. Um, I decided to write it because I've always been intrigued by stories. I taught storytelling to my law students as a way of communicating about your clients and with your clients. Um, and way back however many years ago when I was in college, I thought about being a, a mythology major. So I've always liked mythology. I loved Joseph Campbell. But a few years ago, a book came out by a woman, Maureen Murdoch, called The Heroine's Journey. And she had been a student of Joseph Campbell's and, you know, totally loved the work that he was doing but just observed in her own work that woman's experiences were a little bit different from the hero's journey. And when she went to talk to him about it, um, at least according to her book, 
his response was, well, women don't need a journey because they're already there. They're already, they already personify what men are looking for. And mm -hmm. she didn't think that was a very satisfactory response and neither do I. Mm -hmm. um, so she wrote a book, The Heroine's Journey, looking at it from a different perspective and talking about how for women, um, there's a lot of inner journeying that has to go on along with the outer quest and that our definition of success may be slightly different from that conquest model that the hero's journey is all about. Um, so I liked the book, but I didn't agree with everything she said either. So I, I thought about it for quite a few years. I wrote a draft of, draft of a book maybe three years ago. And then COVID came and I said, I might as well write this book. <laughs> I had it on my mind for a while. And it, it actually was a journey for me writing it because I had to kind of recreate some of the experiences and the learning that I had been through to get where I am now. And what I wanted to do was to give women the tools, the questions to ask themselves to get to the core of who they really are. And it was, um, it was really a part of my own personal journey and also my desire to see things change um, in society, to see more people start to look at life holistically instead of dualistically. So anyway, I sat down during COVID and wrote it. <laughs> and I think that writing, well, they say starting a business is the greatest self-development process in the world. And I agree with that, but I also think writing a book is. Mm -hmm. You learn as much about yourself as you are able to communicate to others. And everything that you that needs healing will surface, will it not? It will. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is right. Things that you thought you dealt with 20 mm -hmm. years ago. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to go back to something because I'm intrigued by, you know, you talked about how you and I graduated from high school the same year. I know mm -hmm. I was told three options, four options, teacher, nurse, mm -hmm. secretary, mm -hmm. um, stay at home mom or whatever, mm -hmm. wife, wife first, I guess. Right. And so I didn't really choose teacher. My parents chose teacher because, but mm -hmm. I wasn't a nurse because I just knew that wasn't me. They chose my college. I went for two years. I dropped out to get married because I didn't mm -hmm. want to be there. Got me to Maryland. I got a job with a large employer who, who said they would pay for more education, but I had to do what they wanted now. And the good girl said, of course. You know, so I went from being a language arts major in second in um, secondary education to um, business business administration with a concentration in finance. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> into the into the pits really of you know mm -hmm. of dominance and all of that. And that was so interesting. I want to know how and but that didn't come to me naturally. I had to mm -hmm. like weave my way into it. How did you know you could go to law school? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> um, so you know, my parents told me girls didn't need to go to college at all. Oh, okay. And um I had never even thought about it. I had a boyfriend in high school. I thought I was just going to get married, but he dumped me and I decided I had to do something. So I, I found myself in college, but I had no plan. And I dabbled in college. I went to, I don't know, five or six different schools over a period of 10 years, trying to figure out what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. So it was not a direct path at all. And if you had told me back then that I was going to be a lawyer, I would have said, no way. I had no interest. I've, I've never been interested in politics. I am now because you have to be, if you're a citizen of the world, you just have to be, but it doesn't interest me. I hate conflict. <laughs> so it wasn't a natural choice for me, but um, I, graduated from college and moved to Boston and worked as a temp secretary. And the first job I got was in a 
a law office, an, an office that oversees lawyers. And, you know, I was a secretary, but my boss saw that I could do more and started giving me little case summaries to write up and things. And I took to it. I liked it. It was um, intellectually interesting to me because I care about fairness a lot. So my boss and another lawyer in the office who has become a friend talked me into taking the LSAT. I took it and I did well. And they said, well, you have to go to law school now. And that's how I ended up in law school. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> Almost similar in a way, you know, mm -hmm. you're paying for it, I don't suppose, but right, you know, right. Um, that, that is so interesting. I wanted to be a writer or mm -hmm. a dancer. So I guess, you know, I, I am finally calling myself a writer. I think Good. I'm finally Good. doing what I wanted to do with my life. Not that I didn't enjoy my career because I enjoyed it very much, but. Did you actually practice law or did you go right into teaching? I practiced law for a while. Um, I didn't love that because like I said, I don't really like conflict. I like mediating. I like bringing people together. I like coming up with solutions. Yeah. Um, but I loved teaching it. So. And I love how you talk about how you teach it. I mean, when you say you taught storytelling to your students as a way to help them tell the story of their clients, was that, mm -hmm. did, were you the only one doing that or was that part of the curriculum? So um, my later years in teaching, I was in a clinical law setting. I was teaching students how to actually practice law. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a growing trend in clinical law to mm -hmm. use storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think people have always done it. They just didn't call it that. True. That would have been a little yeah. too something feminine or something. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I've always been offbeat as a lawyer. My, my first article and the one that gets quoted the most was about law as right livelihood. And I used to teach my students, you know, you came here for a purpose. Don't lose sight of that. Um, because it's so easy to get caught up in getting good grades, getting on law review, making a lot of money. But that's not why you came. So remember why you're here. Oh, I love that. Thank mm -hmm. you. So tell everybody again the name of your book, how they can find it, and how they can also, what, what else you do out there that can help people? <laughs> um, so when, when times are good, I lead retreats. I love doing that because it's a blend of coaching and teaching. I'm trained as a life coach. I don't do one-on-one -on -one coaching anymore, um, but I love leading retreats. I don't have any planned right now. I'm still feeling my way around how the world is going to be with the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So mostly now I write and I decided for Women's History Month to put my book on sale on Amazon for 99 cents. So if you just type in Shiro's Journey, it should come up and you can get the Kindle version for 99 cents all month in March. Yeah. I'm working on my second book now. Oh, what's that about? And it's about what we were talking about, work-life alignment. What does that look like and how do you get it? Mm -hmm. I think that's just a needed story because I've always said that um, at least most of my adult life have said that work life balance is a myth and we can't mm -hmm. even strive for it because sometimes right. as long as we're conscious about our decisions, which is what you were teaching your students, mm -hmm. you consciously decide to give your all to this right. and make a different decision when you're ready to. And I think that is so important right. for young women, especially Right. And any age woman, really, because I think there are still many women out there in their 70s and 80s who are thinking that they need more balance in their lives. Yes, and it's not absolutely. Like balance we're always mm -hmm. looking for either. We think it is, but we're actually looking for more life, I think. Yes. yes. Life. So what would be your final word of wisdom here? It could be something you've already said. It could be something new or just something that you think is the most impactful uh, message that you want to mm -hmm. leave our audience today. Um. I think that um, I can't say it better than Joseph Campbell did when he said, follow your bliss. Mm -hmm. I think that's misinterpreted a lot, but what it really means is, you know, you you have this one chance to be who you really are and don't waste your time trying to be 
who everybody else wants you to be. Yes. I think that's a great end to our conversation here today. So thank you so much for this conversation. I think your work fills a really important gap um, because I believe that the more we women share or shed those stories, the better able we are to step up, be seen and heard in greater ways and make our unique impact on the planet and make the change that we see that, that we believe is necessary out there. So I think you're doing a great, a great work here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us for the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman magazine and global community Facebook page. If you love this interview and want to share it with your friends, it will be on our YouTube channel in the next 48 hours. So go on over to On Purpose Woman Global Community on YouTube. Subscribe and hit the notification bell. We have close to 100 um, interviews up there already that are full of inspiration, education, motivation to help you live your best life. We have six more conversations lined up for you in March and April. On Monday, Catherine Yarborough, who is the other host of the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show, uh, we'll talk with Mia Zachary about a New Testament to the Divine Feminine. Then next Tuesday, I'll talk with Veronica Gray on how to reignite your life and live. And on Tuesday, I'll actually chat with Catherine Yarborough. I mean, on Thursday, I'm sorry. I'll chat with Catherine Yarborough about how to speak like what you say matters. So thank you again for watching the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show.